Yes, man. Welcome back to the DCS world. Welcome to the F-18-3 Hornet. Uh, we're into the training missions for the Hornet here. So let's do it. Oh god, I hate this music. Alright. <coughs> so, introduction and basic controls. I don't need to do this. Cold start. Welcome to this training lesson to start off the Hornet. So much you will find yourself a problem about Hornet with a bunch of life. It's me rather wrong to subscribe to my new mods and make the all to the start function. And then for this lesson, we'll go to the full start of the seat here. Alright, cold start. Let's do it. Welcome to this training lesson on starting up the Hornet. In some missions, you will find yourself in a cold and dark hornet that you will need to bring to life. While this can be a rather long process as described in the manual, you can also enable the auto start function. However, for this lesson, we'll review the full startup procedure. Press spacebar when you are ready to get started. This cockpit. We look like on the outside. Fuck yeah. Alright, let's get started. The first thing we need to do is enable the two batteries. This will allow operation of the canopy and power the engine igniters. You'll also notice that the integrated fuel and engine indicator, or IFE, in the lower left portion of the instrument panel will have power. Move the battery switch to the up or on position with a right mouse button click. Alright, battery on. The Hornet has two fire detection circuits, A and B, that test for fire in the engines, auxiliary power unit, and bleed air system. Before we go into detail on that though, check that the hydraulic brake pressure gauge for the wheel brakes shows at least 3000 PSI. Confirm this by looking at the gauge, which is located to the left and up from the highlighted fire test switch. Okay, now put the spring loaded fire test switch in the up test A position and keep holding it up to test the A circuits. To do this, place the mouse over the fire test switch and hold down the right mouse button. Keep holding the mouse button down and do not release it until it runs through all the fire test audio warnings. In addition to the audio warnings, also note the fire test warning lights on the upper left and right portions of the instrument panel. When it's done, press spacebar. Engine fire left. Engine fire left. Engine fire right. Engine fire right. APU fire. APU fire. Bleed air left. Bleed air left. Bleed air right. Bleed air right. All right. We will now do the same thing for the B circuit. After waiting 10 seconds, place the mouse over the fire test switch and hold down the left mouse button to move the switch in the down test B position. Keep holding it down and then release it once all the fire warning audio messages have been played. Well done. Press spacebar. Engine fire left. Engine fire left. Engine fire right. Engine fire right. APU fire. APU fire. Bleed air left. Bleed air left. Bleed air right. Bleed air right. Alright. 
Good job. Note that in the top left portion of the IFE, you can see the RPM and temp of both the left and right engines. These will be important for when we start the engines. We will now turn on the auxiliary power unit, or APU. This is a small, self-contained engine that augments the bleed air system and will start turning the engines for engine starts. Place the APU control switch in the up or on position with a left mouse button click. Before I do that, I'm going to close the canopy. So we look like outside with the canopy closed. Fuck yeah. My APU on. Once the green light next to the APU switch comes on, move the engine crank switch to its right position, marked by the R, with a right mouse button click. This will allow the APU to power the air turbine starter, or ATS, which in turn allows the aircraft mounted accessory drive, or AMAD, to start turning the fan blades within the right engine. Once the right engine RPM has reached 20%, as indicated on the IFE, move the right throttle from off to idle by pressing right shift home. This in turn will introduce fuel into the engine combustion chamber and start the igniters. Once the right engine RPM has reached 60%, the right engine start cycle is complete and the right generator is automatically engaged. Once at 60%, press spacebar. When we conducted the tests of the A and B fire right, test right circuits, up. we also closed the bleed air shutoff right valves. Controls. We need to reopen right these controls. by rotating the bleed air knob clockwise 360 degrees from norm to norm. Do this by right mouse button clicking on the outer portion of the knob. When done, press spacebar. With the right engine running and generator power on, place the left and right digital display indicators, or DDIs, to the day position using right mouse button clicks on both brightness selector knobs. Next, rotate the HUD Symbology brightness control knob clockwise by placing your mouse over it and rotating your mouse wheel forward. Once you see video displayed on the left and right DDIs and HUD, press spacebar. In the lower center of the instrument panel is the multi-purpose color display, or MPCD. Rotate the power and brightness control knob to the full bright setting by placing your mouse over the knob and rotating your mouse wheel forward. It will take a few moments to power on. Press spacebar once you see video displayed on the MPCD. On the left DDI, press the menu push button to bring up the support page. The support page has several sub pages like the checklist, engine, fuel, ADI, and HSI. For now though, press the FCS push button to select the flight control system page. The FCS page shows the status of the control surfaces and any detected FCS errors. The X's indicate detected errors, but we will address those once the left engine is started. You should not see any 2, R, or FADEC caution messages along the bottom of the left DDI. Note that by default, you will not have the built-in test or bit page on the right DDI. We'll come back to this. During this lesson and future lessons, you will often see and hear the master caution. This is the large yellow labeled button on the instrument panel that will light when any caution condition is triggered. There will also be an accompanying deedle deedle sound to draw your attention. Press this button or click on it to acknowledge the caution and extinguish the light.
Press the master caution again to restack the caution and advisory notices along the bottom of the left DDI. Cautions will be along the top and advisories in smaller text along the bottom. If the left DDI <coughs> is not on, then the caution and advisories will be displayed on another display. By default though, they will be on the left DDI. The Hornet comes equipped with an Inertial Navigation System, or INS. Use right mouse clicks to set the INS switch, located on the sensor panel to the ground position. This will start an INS ground alignment. Now it is time to crank the left engine. Go ahead and move the engine crank switch to its left position, labeled L, by left mouse clicking it. Once the left engine is at 20% RPM, as indicated on the IFE, move the left throttle from off to idle by pressing right alt home. This will add fuel to the engine and start the igniters. When the left engine is at 60% RPM, press spacebar to continue. On the FCS page, we have quite a few X's indicating abnormal FCS readings. To clear these, press and hold the FCS reset button. Located in the back of the left console is the panel for the onboard oxygen generation system, or OBOX. Go ahead and set the OBOX switch to its up, on position. To the left of the INS switch is the radar switch. Set this switch to the operate position using your right mouse button. Don't worry, the radar will be in silent mode. You won't microwave the ground crew. Our next step will be to run a bit on the flight control system, or FCS. Before doing so, set the flaps to the up, auto position with the F key, or two right mouse button clicks on the flap switch. We'll now run a bit of the flight control system. This moves the control surfaces to their limits to test for any software or mechanical errors. First, select the FCS bit page from the bit page on the right DDI. To run the FCS bit, we'll need to activate two controls at the same time. While holding up on the FCS bit switch on the right wall, press the FCS push button on the right DDI. Upon doing so, you'll see the controls being cycled on both the FCS DDI page, and if you look outside the cockpit, you can watch the wing and tail control surfaces moving. Once the FCS bit is complete, marked by the beep tone, place the flap switch in the center or half position with a left mouse button click on the switch. Takeoff is done with flaps set to half. Once we are airborne, we'll move them to auto. For takeoff, we will want our stabs trimmed for 12 degrees. To set this, press and hold down the takeoff trim button. Upon doing so, you will also notice that the stab values on the FCS page will change to 12. The leading edge flaps, trailing edge flaps, and rudder should all have values of 30 degrees. You should also have no X's on the FCS page. Uncage the backup ADI by placing your mouse over the SAI cage knob and rotating the mouse wheel aft until the red flag is stowed. Close the canopy by holding the canopy control switch in the down, closed position until the canopy is closed. Do this by pressing the key combination or placing the mouse over the switch and holding down the left mouse button. Once the canopy is closed, press spacebar to continue. At this point, the INS has been aligned as indicated on the MPCD HSI page. Move the INS switch from ground to nav with one right mouse button click on the switch. 
Prior to taxi, press the menu push button on the left DDI to go to the TAC or tactical page. On the TAC page, you have access to sub-pages like the store's management system, attack radar, HUD, and electronic warfare pages. On the left DDI TAC page, select the HUD push button to display a mirror of the HUD on the DDI. This can be useful when head down or in case of HUD failure. Let's now set up the right DDI. Press the menu push button on the right DDI to bring up the tactical page. Press the menu push button again to bring up the support page. Now on the support page, press the FCS push button. We will want the HUD on the left DDI and the FCS page on the right DDI when we taxi and take off. The parking brake system is operated with a yellow and black parking brake handle. The handle is currently in the park position, indicated by the fact that the park label is visible to the pilot. Release the parking brake now by rotating the handle 45 degrees counterclockwise from the extended position. This can be achieved by left mouse button clicking the handle or pressing the right alt P key. This will release the lock and allow the handle to return to the horizontal stowed position where the Emerge label is visible to the pilot. This concludes the current lesson on starting up the Hornet. As mentioned earlier though, there is also an option for automatically starting up the Hornet by pressing the left window's Home key. You can end the lesson now by pressing the Escape key. All right, we did it. We started up. See what we look like on the outside. Fuck yeah. Oh, they fixed the sounds. They fixed the sounds. Fuck yeah. Taxi and take off. In this lesson, we're starting an upper running hornet. We will learn a taxi to and take Airfield taxi and take off. In this lesson, we are starting in an up and running hornet, and we will learn how to taxi to the runway and take off. Before we taxi, though, let's set up a few more items that we did not cover in the cold start lesson. Press spacebar when ready. During low light operations like this evening, place the landing and taxi light switch in the up on position. Now, set up your position, formation, and strobe lights as you desire. The formation lights, or slime lights, are low intensity green lights that aid in close in formation flying. Position lights are red and green lights that mark the left and right sides of the aircraft, and the strobe are two flashing red lights on the tail. When done, press spacebar. Time to set up your internal lights. The instrument dial controls instrument panel lighting. The console dial controls the lighting on the left and right consoles. The flood dial illuminates the forward section of the cockpit. And the chart dial controls lighting of your lap area. The light's test switch will test all cockpit warning and caution lights. The worn caution dial allows you to adjust the illumination of those lights. The mode switch allows you to select default internal lighting for day, night, and night vision goggle use. Experiment with these and press spacebar when ready to move on. On the altimeter, 
Rotate the pressure setting knob with the mouse wheel to set an airfield pressure elevation of 29.90 atmospheric pressure. Press spacebar when it's set. To steer the Hornet when taxiing, we will use the nose wheel steering, or NWS, by pressing the S key, or the NWS button on the control stick. When engaged, as indicated by the NWS indication on the bottom right portion of the HUD, rudder inputs will steer the aircraft left and right. When the NWS button is held down, nose wheel steering high, or NWS high, is enabled and allows a tighter turn radius. This is quite helpful on a crowded carrier deck. Press spacebar to continue. To get rolling, slowly increase the throttles until you have forward movement, but do not exceed 75% engine RPM. Press Z to steer left and X to steer right. Taxi forward to the runway directly ahead. Keep taxiing forward and practice both normal NWS and NWS high steering. Come to a halt just short of entering the runway by using the toe brakes at the top of the rudder pedals. Before entering the runway, arm the ejection seat by moving the ejection seat safe armed handle on your right in the down position so that the armed label becomes visible. Also, tighten your restraints. Check left and right for traffic. Increase engine RPM and enter the runway. Once on the runway, align the aircraft down the center line and come to a halt on the 2-5 runway heading marker. Press spacebar to continue. On the right DDI, confirm that the stab position is set to 12 for both stabilators. While holding down the wheel brakes, increase engine RPM to 80% and check that the temps on the IFE do not exceed 800 degrees Celsius. In a Hornet, you always take off an afterburner. Release the brakes and push the throttles all the way forward to full afterburner. As you roll down the runway, keep aligned down the middle with very small rudder inputs. Keep a small amount of back stick and the Hornet will automatically rotate and fly off the runway. Raise the landing gear by moving the landing gear control handle in the up position. Then raise the flaps by setting the flap switch to the up auto position. Congratulations, you have just taken off in a Hornet. You can end the lesson now by pressing the escape key.
That was bad as hell. It's so overview in Tucker and EDF navigation. Be part of any missions that didn't navigate to and from the targets, such as to us when it provides automatic direction finding or ADF and tactical air navigation or TACAM. ADF uses VOR stations. So, I don't think it's VOR stations, I believe it's MBB stations. But anyways, use VOR stations located throughout the map to get bearing only information to them and TACAM stations are co-located with many air fleets that craft carries in some area with fuelers. TACAM can provide both bearing and range is more than depending on the source and TACAM range used. Attack on an ADF navigation. A key part of any mission is the ability to navigate to and from the target. Two such tools the Hornet provides are Automatic Direction Finding, or ADF, and Tactical Air Navigation, or TACAN. ADF uses VOR stations located throughout the maps to get bearing only information to them and TACAN stations are co-located with many airfields, aircraft carriers, and some aerial refuelers. TACAN can provide both bearing and range, or just one of them depending on the source and TACAN mode used. In this lesson, we will discuss how to select ADF and TACAN navigation, and the steering information provided. I currently have the lesson paused as we first discuss a few items. Press spacebar to continue. For this lesson, we will be using an ADF example and then TACAN to navigate back to our home training base at Tobaletti. Let's start with a simpler ADF. To start, let's first select the Horizontal Situation Indicator, or HSI, for the left DDI. Press the menu Time push button on the left DDI to bring us to the tactical page. Note that this button will indicate Menu when on the ground, but will show Time when airborne. Let's press the same push button again to bring us to the support page. Now on the support page, press the HSI push button. The HSI is your primary navigation page that will display TACAN, Waypoint, and ADF navigation data. In the center of the HSI is an aircraft symbol that represents your position from a top-down vantage. Your true airspeed is to the left of the symbol and ground speed to the right. Centered and around the aircraft symbol is a compass rose, and on the very top is a luber line that indicates your heading in regards to the compass rose. Along the top of the HSI is the SCL, or scale, push button. Consecutive presses of this push button will cycle through the scale range options of the HSI. Press spacebar to continue. An ADF is assigned to a specific frequency which can also be stored as a preset on one of the two radios. In this case, we have the VOR ADF near Katezi Airfield preset as Channel 2 on Radio 1. Right now, Radio 1 is set to Channel 1, as you can see in the Channel Select window for Radio 1. To select a new channel preset, place your mouse over the Radio 1 select dial and rotate the mouse wheel forward until 2 is displayed. When you do, you will soon hear the characteristic ADF identification code for that VOR station. Press spacebar to continue. <coughs> to display the bearing to the VOR station on the HSI, we need to set the UFC ADF function select switch to Radio 1. To do this, right mouse button click on the switch. With that done, you will now note a small circle along the outside of the compass rose at the 1 o'clock position. This is your bearing to the ADF signal. There is no range information though. As you can see, ADF is quite simple. Let's move on to TACAN. Press spacebar when ready. In order to display all TACAN information on the HSI and HUD, press the TCN or TACAN push button on the HSI. Upon doing so, it will be boxed. Now we need to turn on the TACAN and set the code of the desired station. Press the TACAN button on the UFC. With the TACAN now selected on the UFC, we have three choices in the option select windows. 
TR is transmit receive and will provide both bearing and range guidance. RCV is for receive Excuse and will me. just provide bearing to the station. And AA is for air to air and will provide either bearing and range or just range depending on the aircraft. By default, we have TR selected, which is fine. The lower two option select windows allow you to select either an X or Y TACAN channel. For example, 67X. Now let's turn on the TACAN by pressing the on off button on the UFC. On the scratch pad, we now see that the TACAN is on and a default value of one. Select clear on the UFC keypad to remove this. We will navigate to the TACAN station at Kobaletti Airfield, which has the TACAN code of 67X. Enter 67 on the UFC keypad and then press the enter button on the UFC. After entering 67X and pressing enter, press spacebar. With the TACAN station now selected, we have some new information on the HUD and HSI. On the right side of the HUD, we have the range to the station in nautical miles and the three-digit code for the station to the right of the distance value. At the top of the HUD, along the heading tape, we have a steering bar that indicates the heading to the TACAN station. On the HSI, we have much more information. In the top left corner of the HSI, we have a data block with three rows. The top row is bearing, distance, the second row is time to go in minutes and seconds, and the bottom row is the station ID. On the outside of the compass rows is an inverted triangle with a T in the center. This indicates your heading to the station. There is a corresponding tail on the other side of the compass rows. Between the aircraft symbol and the T symbol is a three-pronged symbol that represents the selected TACAN station. Press spacebar to continue. When the TACAN station has been selected, you can use the course set switch, labeled CRS, on the top right corner of the MPCD to set a course line that is centered on the selected station. Left click rotates the course line counterclockwise and a right mouse click moves it clockwise. When a course has been set, the course line will be displayed on the HSI and on the HUD, with dots to represent four and eight degrees of course offset. Press spacebar to continue. When a TACAN beacon is selected, you will also hear the coded ID. You can adjust the volume of this with the TACAN volume control knob labeled TCN on the volume panel. Press spacebar to continue. You can view air fuel TACAN beacon channels by going to the F10 map, clicking on an airfield, and then reading the data of the airfield. This concludes our look at the HSI, ADF, and TACAN. When you are ready, press spacebar to unpause this lesson and practice navigating using the ADF and TACAN. All right. Waypoint navigations. Attacking navigation is great to get back to an airfield or carrier. Many times you need to, to set arbitrary navigation points. This where waypoint navigation comes in. The point allows you to have three sequences of waypoints you can use to mark anything from a turn point to a target or to a threat location. Waypoints can be created in both the mission editor and while in the Hornet cockpit, but it's less than focus focusing the waypoint sequence already created. Waypoint navigation. While TACAN navigation is a great tool to get back to your airfield or carrier, Many times you will need the ability to set arbitrary navigation points. This is where waypoint navigation comes in. The Hornet allows you to have three sequences of waypoints that you could use to mark anything from a turn point, a target, or to a threat location. Waypoints can be created in both the mission editor and while in the Hornet cockpit. For this lesson though, we will focus on a waypoint sequence already created. I currently have the lesson paused. Press spacebar to continue. Let's first set the left DDI to the HSI page. Press the time push button. We are now on the tactical page, so a press of the time push button again will bring us to the support page. 
Now on the support page, select the HSI push button. This will display the horizontal situation indicator. Much of this will look familiar from the TACAN lesson. Instead of pressing the TCN push button though, press the waypoint push button this time. This will box waypoint and allow display of more waypoint navigation information on the HSI and HUD. We are currently at waypoint zero as indicated on the right side of the HUD and between the up and down arrows along the right side of the left DDI. Press the up arrow to select the next waypoint, waypoint one. With waypoint one selected, Note the distance to the waypoint and the waypoint number is displayed on the right side of the HUD and a steering bar to the waypoint is along the heading tape. On the HSI, you can now better see the waypoint marker that appears as a small circle with a dot in the center. By pressing the SEC1 push button, it will box it and display dashed connecting lines between the waypoints in the selected sequence. In the top right portion of the HSI, data of the selected waypoints is shown. The top row is the bearing and distance to the waypoint, and below is the hours, minutes, seconds to the waypoint. Inscribed inside the compass rows is a triangle that indicates the heading to the selected waypoint, with a corresponding tail opposite of it. Press spacebar to continue. As with TACAN, you can also set a course line through the selected waypoint. This can be useful by placing a waypoint on a runway and using the course line for a direct approach or as a reference for the downwind leg of an overhead landing pattern. Press spacebar to continue. By selecting the auto waypoint sequence option, the navigation system will automatically select the next waypoint in sequence as each waypoint is reached. This avoids having to manually select the next waypoint while navigating a sequence. When you are ready, I will unpause the lesson and allow you to navigate the waypoint sequence. Ahead of you is the sequence of waypoints along a low altitude flight plan. Try to fly through each gate in sequence. Press spacebar to unpause the lesson. I'm not going to do that, I'm just going to... To more easily fly this sequence, you may wish to adjust the HSI scale. You can use this in conjunction with the next waypoint distance and steering cue on the HUD to best align yourself to intercept the next gate. Okay. At any point you can end this lesson by pressing the escape key. I'm just going to end it. E4 Air Food Street in London. Here's this, we're going to take off and navigate, but our up must come down. This lesson will go to the base of landing on Hornet and Air Food using visual flight rules. Conditions using a straight in approach. Uh, this will also be for layer instant flight rules, iPhone landing lesson. E4 Air Food Street in London. In previous lessons, we learned how to take off and navigate, but what goes up must come down. In this lesson, We'll go over the basics of landing a Hornet at an airfield in visual flight rules conditions using a straight-in approach. This will also be useful for the later instrument flight rules landing lesson. I currently have the lesson paused as I want to first outline the basics of an airfield VFR straight-in approach. Before flying this lesson, please make sure you are familiar with the HUD symbology as described in the manual and first lesson. Press spacebar to continue. You'll start the approach 11 miles out at 3,000 feet barometric and 260 knots on approach to runway 07 at Coboletti. Once at 5 miles, you will be at 1,500 feet, and this will place you on a 3-degree glide path to the runway. To measure your glide path angle, reference your velocity vector on the HUD in relation to the pitch ladder. A 3-degree flight path is standard for a Hornet landing. For a straight-in approach, we will keep the HUD showing barometric altitude. This will also be true for IFR landings. Press spacebar to continue. Uh. After the lesson is unpaused, 
Reduce your throttle to idle and fly through the gates ahead. Once your airspeed is below 250 knots, lower the landing gear by moving the landing gear control handle down. Do this by left clicking the handle or by pressing the G key. Also lower the flaps to fold down by moving the flap switch in the down fold position, either by left clicking on the switch twice or pressing left control F. Once the gear and flaps are down, keep flying through the gates and get the aircraft to an on-speed angle of attack. This is the proper AOA that will achieve the correct hook angle to catch the target wire of the carrier. You will want an angle of attack of 8.1 degrees, which will place the velocity vector on the HUD in the center of the E bracket. Additionally, your angle of attack target of 8.1 degrees is indicated by the AOA indexer lights to the left of the HUD frame. When at the on-speed AOA, the center yellow circle will be illuminated. Use the throttle to adjust your glide path and pitch trim to adjust AOA when the flaps are down. Use the first part of this flight to practice stabilized on-speed flight. Press spacebar to continue. When you're ready, press spacebar and I will unpause the lesson. Being below 250 knots, go ahead and lower your landing gear and drop the flaps to full. Reduce your airspeed by setting the throttles to idle. You may also wish to extend your speed brake by using the speed brake switch on the right throttle grip or by pressing left shift B to get slower more quickly. Note the SPD BRK light on the instrument panel when the speed brake is extended. As you slow below 140 knots, Retract the speed brake by using the speed brake switch or pressing left control B. Adjust the throttle and stick trim to maintain 8.1 degrees of angle of attack. Velocity vector inside the E bracket. Use the gates as a reference for your glide path by keeping the velocity vector in the center of the next gate. At this point, you should be on speed with an angle of attack of 8.1 degrees, indicated by the velocity vector in the center of the E bracket on the hood. Use throttle input to adjust your glide path such that the E bracket is positioned over the runway threshold. Use pitch trim to keep on speed AOA. You should now be on a 3 degree glide path down the runway. Maintain on-speed AOA and your glide path should be aligned with the runway threshold.
Maintain on-speed AOA and fly the aircraft onto the runway with a vertical velocity of no more than 750 feet per minute, as displayed over the HUD altitude indication. Do not flare. Once the nose wheel comes down, use the rudder to keep the aircraft centered down the runway and use the wheel brakes to bring her to a halt. Well done. You can end the lesson now by pressing the escape key. Nice. Oh god. Overhead pattern. Damn it. Hate this. We have forever airfield uh, overhead pattern landing. In this previous lesson, we learned how to perform a simple straight landing during VFR conditions. In this lesson, we're going to learn how to perform an overhead landing pattern. This should be your usual VFR landing pattern. It should be very similar to the case one and case two landing pattern that we use to land on the boat. Alright, overhead, uh, VFR over airfield overhead landing. In the previous lesson, we learned how to perform a simple straight in landing during VFR conditions. In this lesson, we're going to learn how to perform an overhead landing pattern. This should be your usual VFR landing pattern, and it will be very similar to a case one landing pattern <coughs> you'll use to land on the boat. I currently have the lesson paused, as I want to first outline the airfield overhead pattern. Before flying the lesson, please make sure you are familiar with the HUD symbology as described in the manual. Press spacebar to continue. Ahead of you is a series of gates that you will fly through. These are designed to instruct you on where you should be during the pattern. You will start the pattern at 800 feet and 350 knots, just to the left of the runway. At the end of the runway, break to the left with a G of 1% of your airspeed, in this case, 3.5 G for 350 knots. As your speed decreases, relax the G to match the speed. At 180 degrees of turn, Level out on the downwind leg and descend to 600 feet, and you should be below 250 knots. When below 250 knots, lower your landing gear and lower the flaps to fold down. Press spacebar to continue. Once on the downwind leg, establish yourself at 600 feet and slow the aircraft to on-speed angle of attack of 8.1 degrees. This can most easily be seen on the HUD by keeping the velocity indicator inside the E bracket. To the left of the HUD frame are the angle of attack indexer lights. When on speed, the center donut should be lit. Maintain on speed angle of attack during the downwind leg. Press spacebar to continue. As you roll out on the runway heading, Fly to place the E bracket on the runway threshold and use throttle adjustments to control your glide path to be 3 degrees. Use pitch trim to keep the velocity vector centered in the E bracket. Press spacebar to continue. Prior to touchdown, do not flare the aircraft, but rather let it fly into the runway with no more than 750 feet per minute, as indicated above your altitude on the HUD. That is an overview of what we will be doing. Before we try this out though, let's first set up a couple of things in the cockpit. First, set the altimeter display on the HUD to display radar altitude by moving the altitude switch on the HUD control panel to the down RDR position. Using what you learned in the TACAN lesson, set the TACAN to 67X and a course of 70 degrees. This is the TACAN channel for Coboletti Airfield and it will provide us useful information to line up our downwind and final approach legs of the pattern. Press spacebar when done, and you are ready to unpause the lesson.
Alright, let's do it. We are now flying a heading of 64 degrees at 370 knots and 1,000 feet. Fly through the gates ahead, which will place us at 800 feet and offset to the right of the runway. We don't want to directly overfly the runway. Maintain an airspeed of 350 knots. Cage the velocity vector on the HUD by pressing the Cage Uncage button to the right of the throttle grip or pressing C. Approaching the end of the runway, we will continue to follow the gates for a 180 degree turn into the downwind leg. The turn rate will be based on a G that is 1% of our airspeed. In this case, 3.5 G for 350 knots. Alright, here we go. Now on the downwind leg, lower your landing gear and set the flaps to full once below 250 knots. Whilst doing this, descend and maintain 600 feet. While on the downwind, establish an on-speed AOA of 8.1 degrees by flying to maintain the velocity vector inside the E bracket on the HUD. Proper AOA is also indicated to the left of the HUD by the indexer lights. Keep a donut displayed on the center of the indexer. Once your left wing tip is a beam of the runway threshold, start a 30 degree bank to the left while maintaining on speed AOA. This is a bit tricky. Use the throttle to control your descent and stick trim pitch to control your angle of attack. Did it.
did it. Oh shit, we're moving again. Oh, we did it. Uh, I don't know if there's anything else I was supposed to do. I landed. So I guess that's it. This is an approach to airfield landing. When we to fight worlds, views of our conditions are not present. It's just night or foul weather. In this minute, approach landing is used. As the name implies, this relies on instruments in the Hornet to provide correct azimuth and glides to approach the selected airfield. The US Navy Hornet uses this world as the instrument carrier landing system, or ICLS. Some are used for carrier landings, uh, and not airfield landings. Even the real world US Hornets do not allow ILS. As such, we will. Said use attack and approach as a method, it's not a three to be provided so from a known distance measuring equipment via me and altitude. Instrument approach and effort landing. When visual flight rules conditions are not present, such as at night or foul weather, an instrument approach landing is used. As the name implies, this relies on the instruments of the Hornet to provide a correct azimuth and glide slope approach to the selected airfield. Although the U.S. Navy Hornet in DCS World has the Instrument Carrier Landing System, or ICLS, this is only used for carrier landings and not airfield landings. Even in the real world, U.S. Hornets do not have ILS. As such, we'll instead use a TAC and approach azimuth and a standard 3-degree glide slope from a known distance measuring equipment and altitude. With a glide slope of 3 degrees, we can use a rule of thumb to calculate the altitude to start our descent. That being, 300 feet of altitude for every nautical mile to the runway threshold. So, a DME of 10 nautical miles would be 3,000 feet. In this lesson, we will use a typical final approach fix with a DME of 10 nautical miles from the runway to start our descent. I currently have the lesson paused. Your Q&H air pressure in inches is already correctly set to 29.92. In other missions, be sure to correctly set your altimeter based on the mission briefing Q&H value. Press spacebar to continue. Using what you learned before, go ahead and set your left DDI to the HSI page and the right DDI to the FCS page. You would most often have the HUD on the left DDI and the HSI on the MPCD, but we'll use this setup to more easily monitor the HSI on the left DDI. Enter the Batumi TACAN code of 16X and set a course line of 119 degrees. This can be found on the airfield approach plate. The course arrow on the HUD will be your primary azimuth steering reference. Once complete, press spacebar. Before we unpause, let's contact Batumi Tower and let them know we're inbound. Press backslash to open the radio menu, then F5 to select ATC, and then F1 for Batumi. If you are using realistic radio, press the COM1 or COM2 to open the radio menu. Later, when Batumi Tower clears you for approach, press F1 to request landing permission. This will instruct the tower to turn on the approach lights. Press spacebar to continue. We now have everything set up for our instrument approach based on TACAN navigation with a controlled 3 degree glide slope from a final approach fix at waypoint 6. Once unpaused, fly to and maintain an airspeed of 250 knots and fly through the gate ahead. Ahead of you are a series of gates to help you stay on azimuth and glide slope. Make sure to fly through each one. When ready, press spacebar to unpause.
Here we go. Reduce throttle to idle until your speed falls to 250 knots and maintain that airspeed until we reach our fixed approach point at waypoint 6. Note the TACAN heading on the HUD and HSI should be pointing directly ahead. To help slow down, you can use the speed brake by pressing left shift B to extend and B to retract. Fly through the gate ahead at waypoint 1. Once your speed is below 250 knots, remember to retract the speed brake if it is still extended by pressing B. Ensure your airspeed is below 250 knots and lower your landing gear and set flaps to full when 5 to 7 miles from the FAF. Passing waypoint 3 and your DME to the TACAN should be 15 miles. Keep an airspeed below 250 knots. Passing waypoint 4. Fly through the next gates on the 3 degree glide slope. To best determine your glide slope, reference the velocity vector on the HUD in relation to the pitch ladder. Fly to maintain the velocity vector two fifths above the negative 5 degree pitch ladder line. Passing waypoint 5. Your next waypoint will be the fixed approach point that will place you 10 miles with a 3 degree glide slope. You are now passing the fixed approach point into Batumi. Maintain your 3 degree glide slope. Note that your TACAN heading should be guiding you directly ahead the entire time, and your TACAN DME decreasing as we draw closer. Maintain on speed angle of attack as you learned in the VFR airfield landing lessons. Keep flying through the gates while on speed.
passing through waypoint 10. The airfield lights should be visible, including the Precision Approach Path Indicator, or PAPI lights. If all white, you are too high. If all red, you are too low. And if white and red, you are on a proper three degree glide slope. You should be on speed and on glide slope, and now be able to visually make out the runway threshold for a visual approach. Adjust power to control your descent such that the velocity vector lines up with your desired touchdown point. Once the wheels are down, apply the wheel brakes by pressing W. Without killing yourself. What an As asshole. See, even without an ILS, it's quite easy to land the Hornet in instrument conditions if you have a fixed control point to plan the landing from. Press escape to end the lesson. Carrier toxin and take off. Okay. Assessing whether a taxi to aircraft carrier to cardboard take off. Pre assessing whether I start the hornet, so we'll be starting in a hot aircraft. Carrier taxi and take off. We will learn to taxi to an aircraft carrier catapult and take off in this lesson. In a previous lesson, we learned how to start up the hornet. When starting up the hornet on the carrier, the only significant difference will be that you will set the INS switch to CV for aircraft carrier instead of ground during the inertial navigation system alignment. So, we will just focus on the taxi and take off from the carrier in this lesson. Looking out of the cockpit to the right is the bow of the aircraft carrier, and catapults 1 to the right and catapult 2 to the left are located here. Looking ahead and bit to our left are the waste catapults of number 3 and 4. In this lesson, we will taxi 2 get hooked up to, and take off from Catapult 2. As you may have noticed, Catapult 1 is currently blocked by parked aircraft. Before taxiing forward, we will need to set our trim based on our total aircraft weight. You can find this on the checklist page from the support menu. It's located on the ACWT line. As you can see, our bird weighs just 46,600 and change. If below 44,000 pounds, set 16 degrees of stab trim. 
If between 44 and 49,000 pounds, set trim to 17 degrees. If over 49,000 pounds, set trim to 19 degrees and afterburners are required for takeoff. So, go to the FCS page on the support menu and use the trim hat or right control period to increase stab trim to 17. When set, press spacebar to continue. Running from the bottom on the checklist page, arm the ejection seat, check that nose wheel steering is on, no warning lights, hook is up, flaps are set to half, trim set to the total aircraft weight, wings match wing fold handle, oxygen on, brakes off, launch bar up, anti-skid off, master arm off, from the MPCD, select WTPT and cycle to waypoint one. Countermeasures off. Radar altimeter to 40 feet. Canopy closed. Master external light switch aft. When all set, press spacebar to continue. Directly to our right is a large yellow rectangle painted on the deck. This is the jet blast deflector or JBD for catapult two. This will redirect our engine exhaust once we power up for takeoff. Normally, you will spread your wings when positioned behind the JVD, but before you taxi over it to the catapult shuttle. Because we are already nearly behind the JVD for catapult two, spread the wings using the wing fold handle by your right knee, or press right shift and right control O. Five seconds after the wings are fully spread, stow the handle with the O key. When they are down and the wing fold handle matches the wing position, press spacebar. Before taxiing forward, hold down the nose wheel steering button or press S. This will keep the nose wheel steering in high gain and allow us to make tighter turns on a crowded deck. This is indicated as NWS high on the HUD. If you have the wings folded, you do not need to hold down the nose wheel steering button to enable NWS high. Slowly increase the throttle while inputting full right rudder. Make sure you are in nose wheel steering high to make the very sharp turn to catapult two to your right. As you taxi over the JBD, align the nose of the aircraft straight down the catapult track. Once aligned directly down the catapult track, slowly and carefully roll forward until the nose wheel is just behind the catapult shuttle. The catapult shuttle is attached to the catapult and is used to launch you down the catapult track. To get the nose just behind the shuttle, you can either use the F2 external view or align the catapult shuttle off catapult 1 to be directly off to your right. Press spacebar when aligned on the catapult and the nose wheel is just behind the catapult 2 shuttle. Alright, let's do this. I have a wingman. They fix the sound. The launch bar on the nose wheel landing gear strut will connect the aircraft to the catapult shuttle. Lower the launch bar by left clicking on the switch.
by your left knee labeled launch bar. With the launch bar down, press U to better align the aircraft on the catapult track and shuttle and attach the hold back. This will also raise the JBD behind you. You can use external F2 view to confirm that the launch bar is attached. Once attached, move the launch bar switch to the raised position. Press spacebar once the launch bar is connected to the catapult shuttle. Now ready for the cat shot. Increase throttles to military power. Wipe the controls by inputting full pitch and roll on the stick and full rudder deflections on the rudder. When ready, go to full power and initiate the catapult stroke. Fuck yeah. Case 1 carrier landing. Two before my case 1, case 2 carrier landing. Face them into the BFR field of headline pan. In fact, many parts land at airfield as much as we do on a bit and maintain this pace with skill. Case 1 carrier landing. Today we will perform a Case 1 and Case 2 carrier landing. This will be very similar to the VFR field overhead pattern. In fact, Navy pilots land at airfields much like they do on the boat to maintain this perishable skill. In regard to a Case 2 landing, this would be the visual approach element of the landing after being guided in from the Marshall Stack CV-1 approach. Case 1 is defined as having a 3,000 foot minimum cloud ceiling and 5 nautical miles of visibility. For today's lesson though, we are going to keep the aircraft carrier stationary, so we can provide some gates that will assist you in the path. Press spacebar to continue. Ahead of you is a series of gates that you will fly through. These are designed to instruct you on where you should be during the pattern. You will start the pattern at 800 feet and 350 knots just starboard of the boat. During this phase of the landing, lower your arrestor hook by moving the arrestor hook handle in the down position. First starting out, we will not break into the pattern until 1.5 nautical miles past the bow of the boat. This will give you plenty of time to get on speed in the downwind leg. At the break, you will make a level turn with the G of 1% of your airspeed, in this case, 3.5 G for 350 knots. As your speed decreases, relax the G to match the speed. You may need to relax or tighten the turn to roll out 1.3 to 1.4 mile of being the boat. At 180 degrees of turn, level out on the downwind leg and descend to 600 feet you should be below 250 knots. Once below 250 knots, lower your landing gear and set the flaps to full. Press spacebar to continue. Once on the downwind leg, establish yourself at 600 feet and slow the aircraft to an on-speed angle of attack of 8.1 degrees. This can most easily be seen on the HUD by keeping the velocity indicator inside the E bracket. To the left of the HUD frame are the angle of attack indexer lights. When on speed, the center donut should be lit. Use of pitch trim is very important to set on speed AOA. Maintain on speed angle of attack during the downwind leg. Press spacebar to continue. 
Once your left wing tip is 5 seconds past the stern, begin a 30 degree bank to the left while keeping your velocity vector just below the horizon line on the HUD. This will place us in a steady rate of turn to the boat while descending. If the boat is moving with 25 to 30 knots of wind over the deck, start your turn when a beam, the white of the round down on the stern of the boat. Your descent rate should be 100 to 200 feet per minute, as indicated on the HUD above the altitude box. 90 degrees through this turn, your altitude should be 500 feet. Past 90 degrees of turn, your descent rate should increase to 500 feet per minute. Only use your instruments for the first 90 degrees of turn. Don't peak. Use your throttle to control your rate of turn and pitch trim to control your airspeed. Press spacebar to continue. As you roll out on the landing course line, acquire the improved Fresno Lens Optical Landing System, or iFLOLS, and match your glide slope such that the center light stays centered between the two green lines. If the light moves above center, you are too high and risk <coughs> reduced throttle. If the light is below center, you are too low and risk a ramp strike unless you increase power. You will fly to maintain on-speed AOA while keeping the ball centered. Prior to touchdown, do not flare the aircraft, but rather let it fly onto the boat at ideally 750 feet per minute, as indicated above your altitude on the HUD. Press spacebar to continue. Before we give this a whirl, let's first set up the landing course line. Using what you learned in the TACAN lesson, set the TACAN to 74 X-ray and the carrier BRC of 350 degrees. This is the TACAN channel for the carrier and it will provide us useful information to line up our downwind and final approach legs of the pattern. Set your HUD to show the radar altitude. To give us final notice when we should be passing over the wake of the boat when in the final turn, set the radar altimeter by your right knee to 370 feet by spinning the knob counterclockwise. Finally, set your left DDI to the HUD and your right DDI to the FCS page. Press spacebar to unpause. We are now flying a heading of 352 degrees and 349 knots and 1,900 feet. Fly through the gates ahead, which will place us at 800 feet and offset to the right of the boat. We don't want to directly overfly the boat, so we can first check to see if the deck is foul. Maintain an airspeed of 350 knots. Anytime you approach the carrier with the intent to land, you should do a hail R check meaning check that the hook is down and engine anti-ice heat if required, anti-skid switch is off, ILS is boxed on the HSI when ICLS is being used, external lights are set for daytime, and rad out set to the HUD. Cage the velocity vector on the HUD by pressing the cage uncage button on the throttle or press C. Lower the arrestor hook by clicking on the lever or pressing H. When at 1.5 miles from the bow, set the throttles to idle and follow the gates for a 180 degree turn into the downwind plate. The rate of turn will be based on a G that is 1% of our airspeed, in this case, 3.5 G for 350 knots.
Once your airspeed is below 250 knots, lower your landing gear and set the flaps to full. Once on the downwind leg of 173 degrees, establish on-speed AOA of 8.1 degrees by flying to maintain the velocity vector inside the E-bracket on the HUD. Use nose-up trim and throttle to set on-speed AOA, not your stick. Above the C-cell indication in the bottom right corner of your HSI is your distance from the course line. This should be between 1.3 and 1.4 miles. Once your left wingtip is 5 seconds past the stern of the boat, start a 27 to 30 degree bank to the left while maintaining on-speed AOA. This is a bit tricky. Use the throttle to control your descent and pitch trim to control your angle of attack. If properly trimmed, you should only have to adjust throttle. Descent rate should be between 100 and 200 feet per minute for the first 90 degrees and 500 for the second 90 degrees. As your nose comes around to the boat's heading, uncage the velocity vector on the HUD and adjust glide slope based on ball position using the throttles. Use pitch trim to maintain on-speed AOA. Keep the velocity vector centered in the E-bracket. Do not flare the aircraft, but rather continue on the glide slope and touch down around 750 feet per minute. Trust the ball. Once down, immediately go to full power in case of a bolter, the arrestor hook failing to hook an arrestor wire. Once at a halt, reduce thrust to idle. Congratulations on landing the Hornet. With practice, this will become second nature. Raise the arrestor hook, fold the wings, and taxi out of the landing area, also called the box. If you intend to taxi back to a catapult for takeoff, perform an FTRD, pronounced Fighter D check. Flaps to half, trim to total weight, rad out to 40 feet, and HUD on the left DDI, and the checklist and then FCS page on the right. You can end the lesson now by pressing the escape key. Fuck yeah, that was almost perfect. No, I'm a little sick, guys. Just so you know. I drank a little too much. Air to air M61 A2 gun. Welcome to this training lesson on use of the Hornet's M61 A2 20mm cannon. Mounted in the nose of the aircraft, it can be loaded with up to 578 rounds of the firing rate by the 4000 to 6000 rounds per minute. When too close for missiles, the gun is a great option in dogfight. Air to air M61 A2 gun. Fuck yeah. Welcome to this training lesson on the use of the Hornet's M61A2 20mm cannon. Mounted on the nose of the aircraft, it can be loaded with up to 578 rounds and has a firing rate of either 4,000 or 6,000 rounds per minute. When too close for missiles, the gun is a great option in a dogfight. I currently have the lesson paused as we talk about the AA gun system. Press spacebar to continue. To start, Let's first get the AA gun set up. The easiest way to do this is by simply pressing aft on the weapon select switch or press left shift and X. Please do so now. Oh shit, I don't remember what I set for this. Hold on. With the AA gun selected, note that the master mode was automatically set to AA. The left DDI displays the AA gun format, the HUD is in the gun auto acquisition mode, 
and the right DDI is in the AA radar page with air combat maneuvering mode selected. Let's first take a closer look at the AA gun format page on the left DDI. Above the wing form, you see the number of gun rounds remaining, 578. And below that, you see the state of the master arm switch. On the left side of the page, you have the gun round type selection of M50 or PGU-28. You want to make sure that this selection matches what you have loaded on the aircraft. Press the M50 push button to select M50 rounds. In the bottom of the left format are push buttons for high and low gun fire rate. Low fires the gun at 4,000 rounds per minute and high fires the gun at 6,000 rounds per minute. Select the high option. I'll select low. With no radar lock on the target, you will use the lead computing optical sight, also called the funnel. Simply put, with a wingspan entered, you will fly your Hornet to place the wingtips of the target's aircraft just touching the sides of the funnel. When they are, you have a good firing solution to hit the target. To enter the correct target wingspan, press the UFC push button. Our target aircraft will be a MiG-29 with a wingspan of approximately 37 feet. The top option select window is marked WSPN for wingspan. Press the option select button to the left. This will allow us to enter a target wingspan. On the UFC keypad, type in 37 and then press enter on the UFC keypad. Press spacebar when done. With that done, you will now note that the WSPN or wingspan indication in the top right portion of the AA gun format page displays 037 to the right. <coughs> Let's take a look at the HUD. Currently, you're in the gun auto acquisition mode. This is indicated by the large dashed circle on the HUD. Also note that the selected weapon, gun, indicated near the bottom center of the HUD and the number of rounds remaining below it. To lock up a target, simply fly to place your target within 5 miles inside the dashed circle. Until you have a target locked though, you can use the gun funnel. In addition to the gun auto acquisition mode, you also have the Boresight BST, Vertical VACQ, and Wide WACQ air combat maneuvering ACM modes. But we will talk about those in a separate lesson. When you are ready, press spacebar and I will unpause the lesson. Ahead of you are two drone MiG-29s. Place them within the dashed circle on the HUD to lock one of them up. Upon doing so, you now have some new information on the HUD for a locked target. You have your VC closure, velocity and target range below it on the right side of the HUD, the locked target has a target designation box or diamond around it, and an aiming reticle with a pipper in the center. Along the outside of the aiming reticle is a line that indicates maximum gun range. Fly to place the pipper in the center of the aiming reticle over the target and pull the trigger when the target is within range. When the pipper is over the target and within range, a shoot cue will appear over the target. To unlock the target, press the undesignated button on your stick, or press S. Hold on. Gonna fire the gun.
Evet. Good job. Now splash the second drone. Splash 2. Great job using the AA gun. This is a great weapon in close and when Winchester on missiles. Press escape to end the lesson. That's it. Hey then. Aim nine L and M sidewinder air to air missile. The system will how to use the aim nine L and M versions of the venerable sidewinder short range infrared yard of air to air missile. Using a cooled infrared seeker, the sidewinder locks onto the hot elements of the target, most often the engines, thus using close range dog bites. The sidewinders are fired to get after launch, however, the sidewinder can be decoyed by the flares and it's less effective against cloud crusher. Haha, <laughs> this is going to be fun. AIM-9LM Sidewinder. Let's do it. In this lesson, we'll learn about how to use the AIM-9L and M versions of the venerable Sidewinder short-range infrared guided air-to-air -air missile. Using a cooled infrared seeker, the Sidewinder locks onto the hot elements of a target, most often the engines. Best used in close-range dogfights, the Sidewinder is a fire and forget after launch. However, the Sidewinder can be decoyed by flares and is less effective against ground clutter. Today we're looking at the L and M versions. The A9L, or Lima, entered production in 1977 and was the first all-aspect homing Sidewinder, meaning it could get a lock on a target at any aspect angle. However, a rear aspect provides much better detection. The mic or AIM-9M, is an improved version of the Lima with better flare rejection and a reduced smoke motor. In a later lesson, we'll take a look at the AIM-9X and the joint helmet mounted queuing system. The Sidewinder can be used on both boresight mode and slaved to a radar locked target. I currently have the lesson paused as we discuss some of its features. To select a Sidewinder, press down on the weapon select switch or press left, shift, and S. Do this now. Oh shit, uh, is it, uh, is it this? No. Uh, is it this? No. There we go. When selected with no target locked on radar, the Sidewinder will be in boresight mode. This is indicated by the single reticle on the HUD that indicates the seeker line of sight. Below on the HUD, you will notice the name of the weapon. 9M in this case, and the number of missiles remaining to the right. To employ a Sidewinder in this mode, fly your Hornet to place the reticle over a target and wait for the Seeker tone to change to a higher pitch. This indicates the Seeker sees and is tracking the target. 
You could then launch the missile by pulling the trigger or pressing the spacebar. To allow the seeker to self-track the target, press the cage uncage button on your throttle or press C when you hear the lock tone. Once self-tracking, the seeker will automatically follow the target within its seeker field of regard. Before trying this though, let's first take a closer look at the AIM-9 format page on the left DDI. Press spacebar to continue. As with the AA gun, you have the remaining gun rounds and master arm indications. Along the wing form are indications for AIM-9 loading. 9L indicates stations with AIM-9L, and 9M indicates stations with AIM-9M. The selected station includes an SEL for selected below it. To cycle through AIM-9 stations, press the AIM-9 select switch on the weapon select switch, or press left shift S. This allows you to switch between AIM-9L and AIM-9M versions. When you are ready, press spacebar and I will unpause the lesson. Wait, press the A9 select switch and the weapon selects. Oh. Okay. You now have two MiG-29 drone targets ahead of you. Fly to place the reticle over one of them until you hear a higher pitched lock tone. You can either launch an AIM-9 now by pressing the trigger on the stick or spacebar on the keyboard, or initiate a self-track by pressing the cage uncage button on the throttle, or pressing C. Once self-tracking, launch an AIM-9. It may take more than one to bring down the mid. All right, Fox 2. Splash 1. Keep an eye on the second MiG-29 and follow it. We will use a radar slave to track for that one. Follow the second drone. To lock up the second drone on radar, press up on the sensor select switch or press right alt and semicolon. This will place the radar in air combat maneuvering or ACM mode. Keep following the second drone. When ACM mode is first selected, the boresight auto acquisition mode is selected. This is indicated by the dashed circle on the HUD. To lock up the target, fly to place the target within the dashed circle and have the target under 10 miles away. Fly to keep the target at about one mile to keep the radar locked. On the HUD is a large Loud. circle that acts as both the AIM-9 allowable steering error circle and as the normalized in-range display, or NERD circle. Fly to keep the small steering dot inside the circle to give the missile the best chance of reaching the target. Along the outside of the circle are two triangle NERD indications. The one at the 6 o'clock position is the missile maximum range, also called RMAX, and the other is the missile minimum range, called R-MIN. The line inscribing the circle indicates target range, and you want this between R-MAX and R-MIN to launch the missile. Also on the HUD is a box or diamond that indicates the line of sight to the locked target, and the smaller circle indicates the AIM-9 seeker line of sight. If you see a large X across the HUD in radar display, your range to the target is less than the minimum range indication. When the target is between R-MAX and R-MIN, the steering dot is inside the ASE circle, and the weapon is armed, the shoot cue will appear, and you can launch the missile by pulling the trigger on your stick. Alright, you ready for this? 3, 2, 1, Fox 2. Goodbye. Nice job, you downed the second drone. Some final thoughts on using the AIM-9. First, the seeker can better track a target from behind than in front. Second, if the target is expending flares, it may decoy your missile. Third, the AIM-9 does not have a large warhead, so it may take more than one to bring down a target. Press escape to end the lesson. That was pretty sweet.
That one's pretty fucking sweet. Can't you get all the silver star? Nice. Alright. M120B and C advanced medium range air to air missile. Let's us to explore the appointment of advanced medium range air to air missile or AMRAM. The AMRAM replaced the older M7 Sparrow with improved range, guidance, weight, and embedded radar seeker in the nose cone. This allows the AMRAM to guide on a target without support from the host aircraft as the missile closes with the target. This in turn allows to watch the aircraft to maneuver without loss of missile guidance to the target. The AMRAM can be queued to targets with the Hornet's radar, or it can be launched at close range just in the midst of seeker. As with all air to air missiles, engagement range is highly dependent on engagement aspect, launch altitude, and launch seat speed. You will receive much greater ranges at 30,000 feet and a closing target than 5,000 feet and a precision target. M120 AMRAM. In this lesson, we'll explore employment of the Advanced Medium Range Air to Air Missile, or AMRAM. The AMRAM replaced the older AIM 7 Sparrow with improved range, guidance, weight, and an embedded radar seeker in the nose cone. This allows the AMRAM to guide on target without support from the host aircraft as the missile closes with the target. This in turn allows the launch aircraft to maneuver without loss of missile guidance to the target. The AMRAM can be queued to targets with the Hornet's radar or it can be launched at a close range just using the missile's seeker. Deliveries of the AIM-120B began in 1994 and replaced the AIM-120A. The AIM-120C was fielded in 1996 and has clipped wings to support internal storage, improved target detection, and greater range. As with all air-to-air -air missiles, engagement range is highly dependent on engagement aspect, launch altitude, and launch speed. You will see much greater launch distances at 30,000 feet on a closing target than 5,000 feet on a receding target. I currently have the lesson paused. To select the AMRAM, press right on the weapon select switch or press left shift and D. Do this now. Okay. Let's first take a look at the AMRAM format page on the left DDI. In the top left corner of the DDI, at push button 6, is the size selection. By pressing on the push button, you have selections to set weapon fusing size to small, medium, and large sized targets. We'll be shooting down some drone MiG-29s, so select small. To the right of the size selection is the radar cross section, or RCS selection. Upon pressing this push button, you have options to set the expected radar cross-section of the target between small, medium, and large. Go ahead and set it to small. Along the right side of the DDI at push button 13 is the step push button. Successive presses cycle the selected AIM-120 stations. You can see AIM-120 loading on the wing form with AB for AIM-120B and AC for AIM-120C. The selected rail stations include the SEL indicator and dual rail stations with indications for right and left rail on the station. Press spacebar to continue. When we selected the AIM-120, we also set the radar on the right DDI to the AIM-120 default settings. These include a range scale of 40 miles, a two-bar scan, an azimuth of 140 degrees, and an interleaved PRF. Let's keep these as is. Press spacebar to continue. The large dashed circle is the most obvious indication of AMRAM selection. This indicates the seeker field of view if launched with no radar lock first. This is termed Mad Dog Launch, and the AMRAM will lock on to intercept the first target it detects within the dashed reticle area out to 10 miles. Below the dashed reticle is the designation for the selected weapon, AB for AIM-120B and AC for AIM-120C. Below that is a visual indication, meaning there is no radar lock, and if launched now, the missile would be in Mad Dog mode. Press spacebar and I'll add some drone targets. On the right DDI radar page, we see a target, or called a hit, on the radar. Let's lock it up by moving the throttle designator controller, or TDC, over it and locking it up. We do this by using the TDC switch on the throttle or by pressing period, comma, backslash, and semicolon to slew it. Once the two vertical bars of the TDC are over the hit, 
press down on the TDC switch or press the enter button. Once the target is locked, press spacebar to continue. With the target locked up, some new information is now available on the HUD. On the HUD is a large, solid circle that acts as both the AIM-120 allowable steering error circle and as the normalized in-range display or NERD circle. Fly to keep the small steering dot inside the circle to give the missile the best chance of reaching the target. Along the outside of the circle are three triangle NERD indications. The one at 6 o'clock position is the missile maximum range also called RMAX, counterclockwise from it is the no escape range, also called RNE. When target range is within RNE, the target could change course and the missile would still have the energy to reach the target. The third indication near the two o'clock position of the nerd circle is the missile minimum range, called RMIN. The line inscribing the circle indicates target range and you want this between RMAX and RMIN to launch the missile. Also on the HUD is a box or diamond that indicates the line of sight to the locked target. A box indicates a friendly target and a diamond indicates it as a hostile. If you see a large X across the HUD and radar display, your range to the target is less than the minimum range indication. When the target is between RMAX and RMIN, the steering dot is inside the ASE circle and weapon is armed, the shoot cue will appear and you can launch the missile by pulling the trigger on the stick or by pressing the spacebar. When between RNE and RMIN, the shoot indication will flash. Press spacebar to continue. Along the right side of the HUD are three lines of information. The top line is an indication of closure velocity, V sub C, and below that is target range in miles. Further down on the right side of the HUD is the timer field. When the locked target is outside the range of the AIM-120 radar seeker, the value will display the time from missile launch at which the AMRAM seeker will turn on and hunt down the target. This is shown as the time in seconds and then ACT. Once the range of the seeker in the AMRAM is less than approximately 10 miles, the time changes to time to go until the missile impacts the target. This is displayed as remaining time and then TTG. The ACT and TTG will be in reference to the last AIM-120 launched. When the target range is 15 miles, launch an AMRAM by pressing and holding the trigger. If the first does not succeed, try again. Let's go him. Splash one. Go ahead and lock up the target flying towards you and press spacebar. Don't engage it. If you don't see one on the radar, Press the up arrow on the radar to increase its display range. Take a look at the air-to-air -air radar format on the right DDI. You'll note that much of the information on the HUD is duplicated there and includes an ASE circle, shoot cue, steering dot, and range indication as along the azimuth steering line to the target. The locked target has the antenna azimuth line running through it and has its speed as Mach to the left and its altitude to the right. The RMAX, RNE, and RMIN are displayed along the antenna azimuth line. When the AMRAM is launched, 
a triangular fly-out symbols appears on the azimuth steering line and travels to the target. Once the missile seeker is active, an A appears below the fly-out symbol. To break a lock, press the undesignated button on the stick or press S. Press spacebar to continue. As noted earlier, you can also use the AMRAM with no radar lock. Termed visual mode, simply fly to place a target within 10 miles inside the HUD reticle and launch the missile. The AMRAM will go after the first target it detects, hostile or friendly. Practice using the AIM-120 against the remaining drones and press escape when you wish to end the lesson. Yeah, I'm not going to do anything. I'm just going to... Edge ground M61 A2 gun. Welcome to this training lesson. Use the Hornet M61 A2 20 mm cannon against ground targets. Mountain that knows the aircraft it can be loaded with up to 578 rounds and is a firing rate of about 4,000 rounds or 6,000 rounds per minute. You need precise fire against an armor lightly armed target. It's going to be a great choice. Edge ground AG gun. Welcome to this training lesson on use of the Hornet's M61 A2 20 mm cannon against ground targets. Mounted in the nose of the aircraft, it can be loaded with up to 578 rounds and has a firing rate of either 4,000 rounds or 6,000 rounds per minute. When you need precise fire against unarmed or lightly armed targets, the gun can be a great choice. I currently have the lesson paused so we can talk about the gun system in AG use. Press spacebar to continue. Confirm that the master arm switch is already set to arm and set the master mode to AG for air to ground or press 2. On the left DDI, we see that we have 578 rounds loaded, master arm switch is set to arm, and that we have a clean aircraft. Next to push button 11, we have the AG gun selection. Go ahead and press it. We are now looking at the AG gun format page on the left DDI. On this page, we can select the gun mode, round type selection, rate of fire, and UFC entry for manual mode. Along the left side of the page, we see that we have mode options of continuously computed impact point, or CCIP, and manual, or man mode. CCIP is boxed, indicated it is the active mode. We'll come back to this soon. Below the mode selection on push buttons 1 and 2 are selections for either M50 or PBU-28 gun rounds. The selection here should match what was selected for the aircraft in the mission editor. You can keep this as is. Along the bottom left of the page are selections for a high rate of fire of 6,000 rounds per minute or a low rate of fire of 4,000 rounds per minute. Note that gun is boxed with a ready indication in the top right portion of the page, meaning the gun will fire when you pull the trigger. Press spacebar to continue. Let's shift our look to the HUD now, which is in AG gun CCIP mode. The most important element of the AG gun HUD is the CCIP gun reticle near the center of the HUD. When showing valid range, it acts as a death dot. You simply fly to place the pipper over the target and fire when the in RNG queue is displayed. Surrounding the pipper dot is a 50 mil reticle composed of tick marks each representing 1,000 feet of slant range. As you get closer to the target, a range tape will unwind counterclockwise around the reticle from 23,000 feet to zero feet. Inscribed inside the reticle will be a line that indicates the current range to the spot under the reticle pipper. Inscribed outside the aiming reticle is the AG gun maximum range. When the current range line is less than the maximum range Q, the in range will be displayed and you can fire the gun with great accuracy. Press spacebar to continue. 
Also on the AG gun HUD is a horizontal bar with what appears to be upturned wings on the end. This is the pull-up cue, and this is there to advise you of potential ground collision. It is not a weapon fragmentation warning. When the velocity vector is below the pull-up cue, the brake X will appear on the HUD. Along the right side of the HUD is your selected AG gun mode. In this case, CCIP in the selected weapon and number of rounds remaining. Okay, too much talk, not enough BERT. Let's try this out and then we'll talk about the manual mode. Press spacebar to unpause and kill some helpless trucks. Ahead of you at waypoint 1 is a group of target trucks in the center of an abandoned airfield. The targets are also marked with a gate and red smoke, impossible to miss. As you get closer to the target group, descend on the target and place the CCIP gun pipper over one of the trucks and squeeze the trigger to fire the gun. Once you've destroyed one, we'll discuss manual mode. Altitude. Altitude. Good job, Annie Oakley. When you're ready to talk about the AG gun in manual mode, level your wings and press spacebar. I've re-paused the mission so we can discuss AG gun in manual mode. If you are not already there, go back to the AG gun format page on the left DDI. Press spacebar when ready to continue. First, select manual mode by pressing push button 4 on the left DDI. Most of this will look the same from the CCIP mode, but we now have a UFC legend next to push button 14. Go ahead and press it. We will now enter a milliradians or mills setting for the fixed gun sight on the HUD. You can use a manual mill setting sight, much like a fixed World War II bombing sight, or what you find on older aircraft like the F5E. On the top option select window, RTCL is displayed, short for reticle. Press the option select button to the left to select it. When selected, a colon will appear to the left of RTCL. Now use the UFC keypad to enter a mill value between 0 and 270 and press enter. Try 10. Upon doing so, the AG gun reticle and pipper will be adjusted to a fixed location on the HUD. The AG gun mode and mill setting will be displayed on the right side of the HUD. And the mill setting will appear to the right of the RTCL indication on the AG gun format page. Press spacebar when ready to unpause the lesson and try this out. Press escape when you are ready to end the lesson. I'm good this one go. Unguided rockets. In this lesson, we look at the use of unguided rockets like the AG gun and simple point and shoot weapon system best used against unarmed lightly armed targets. It's uh, an area effect weapon, not designed for precision attack, as such is often used in rapid fire mode in which all rockets in a pod of fire at once have you can also fire one rocket. Rockets. In this lesson, we'll take a look at the use of unguided rockets. Like the air-to-ground gun, it is a simple point-and-shoot weapon system against unarmed and lightly armed targets. 
It's an area effect weapon and not designed for precision attack. As such, it's often used in a ripple fire mode in which all rockets in the pod fire at once. However, you can also fire one rocket at a time. We have both 2.75 inch rockets loaded on our inboard stations in 19 rocket Lao 68 pods and 5 inch Zuni rockets on the outboard stations in 4 rocket Lao 10 pods. From the mission editor, the inboard rocket stations are hardwired for ripple fire mode and the outboard stations are set to single fire mode. First, select AG master mode. Okay. On the left DDI, under the top row of push buttons, are selections for 10S and 68R. 10S indicates Lao 10 with Zuni rockets set to single fire mode, and 68R indicates Lao 68 with 2.5 inch rockets set to ripple fire mode. Select 10S at push button 6. We are now looking at the rocket's format page on the left DDI. On this page we can select the rocket delivery mode, launch type selection, hot gun, and UFC entry for manual mode. Along the left side of the page we see that we have mode options of continuously computed impact point or CCIP and manual or man mode. CCIP is boxed, indicated it is the active mode. We'll come back to these soon. Below the mode selection on push buttons 2 and 3 are selections for either single or salvo. When single is selected, rockets will just be launched from the selected rocket pod. A selected pod is indicated as boxed on the wing form. When salvo is selected, all rocket pods of the selected type will fire their rockets. Note that either one rocket per pod or all rockets per pod will be launched based on the single and ripple fire selections in the mission editor. In the top right of the page at push button 11 is the selection for hot gun. When selected, gun is boxed with a ready indication to the left. In hot gun mode, pulling the trigger will fire the gun with the gun cross on the HUD acting as your boresight aiming reference. Below the hot gun selection is the step option at push button 13. Successive presses of step cycles through the selected rocket pod of the selected type when in single mode. One final note on the rocket format page, a diamond symbol under the wing form indicates an adapter to carry more than one weapon on the station. Press spacebar to continue. Let's look at the HUD now, which is in rocket CCIP mode. The most important element of the rocket HUD is the CCIP gun reticle near the center of the HUD. When showing valid range, it acts as a dot of destruction and mayhem. Fly to place the pipper over a target and press the weapon release button, or press enter when the in-range cue is displayed to rain your fury on the target. Around the center pipper dot is a 50 mil reticle composed of tick marks, each representing 1,000 feet of slant range. As you get closer to the target, a range tape will unwind counterclockwise around the reticle from 23,000 feet to zero feet. Inscribed inside the reticle will be a line that indicates the current range to the spot under the reticle pipper. Inscribed outside the aiming reticle is the rocket maximum range indication line. When the current range line is less than the maximum range line, in RNG will be displayed on the HUD and you can fire rockets with accuracy. Press spacebar to continue. Also on the rocket HUD is a horizontal bar with what appears to be upturned wings on the end. This is the pull-up cue and this is there to advise you of potential ground collision. It is not a weapon fragmentation warning. When the velocity vector is below the pull-up cue, the brake X will appear on the HUD. The rocket element is located on the right side of the HUD and indicates our selected mode, CCIP, and the number of rockets remaining. In this case, 22. Near the top center of the HUD is the bore sight line of the M61A2 gun. And this is your gun cross for hot gun mode. Press spacebar to unpause and kill some helpless trucks. Ahead of you at waypoint one are groups of target trucks at an abandoned airfield. The targets are also marked with a gate and red smoke. 
As you get closer to the target group, descend on the target and place the CCIP rocket pipper over one of the truck groups and press the weapon release button, or press right alt and spacebar to fire rockets. If you have hot gun enabled, you can also fire the gun with the trigger or spacebar. Once you've destroyed the truck, we'll discuss manual mode. Altitude. Altitude. Good job, Carlos Hathcock. When you're ready to talk about using rockets in manual mode, level your wings and press spacebar. I've repaused the mission so we can discuss rockets in manual mode. If you're not already there, go back to the rockets format page on the left DDI. Press spacebar when ready to continue. First, select 68R at push button 7 so we can try 2.5 inch rockets in ripple fire mode. This will provide a large spread of rockets to saturate an area. Next, select manual mode by pressing push button 4 on the left DDI. Most of this will look the same from the CCIP mode, but we now have a UFC legend below the step selection. Go ahead and press UFC at push button 14. Now enter a milliradians or mills setting for a fixed rocket site on the HUD. You can use a manual mill setting site, much like a fixed World War II bombing site or what you'd find on an older aircraft like the F5E. On the top option select window, RTCL is displayed, short for reticle. Press the option select button to the left to select it. When selected, a colon will appear to the left of reticle. Now use the UFC keypad to enter a mill value between 0 and 270 and press enter. Try 20. Upon doing so, the rocket pipper will be adjusted to a fixed location on the HUD. The rocket mode, or man, and mill setting will be displayed on the right side of the HUD and the mill setting will appear to the right of the reticle indication on the rocket format page. Press spacebar when ready to unpause the lesson and try this out. Press escape when you are ready to end the lesson. I'm not going to try it. I just want to get the training. CCIP bombing mode. Today we're going to start dropping some iron in our jet. We have Mark 83 1,000 pound bombs and Mark 84. 2,000 pounds, high explosive unguided bombs. These can be delivered in manual, continuous complete impact point or CCIP in automatic or auto release modes. These modes will also apply to other bombs like counter simulations and high drug bomb modes. In this lesson, we'll look at CCIP modes with three full bombs. For this lesson, we'll dive into CCIP release mode. CCIP bombing mode. Where's the sound? Today we're going to start dropping some iron. On our jet, we have a Mark 83 1,000 pound and Mark 84 2,000 pound high explosive unguided bombs. These can be delivered in manual, continuously computed impact point or CCIP and automatic or auto release modes. These modes will also apply to other bombs like canister munitions and high drag bomb modes. In this lesson, we'll look at the CCIP modes for free fall bombs. First, press the AG Master Mode button, or 2. 
Now let's look at the left DDI, which is showing the stores page. Below the top row of push buttons are the two bomb types loaded on your jet. 83B is for the Mark 83 and 84 is for the Mark 84. To select a bomb type to drop, you simply select the push button above the bomb label. Select a big ol' Mark 84 first by pressing push button 7. We're now in the bomb's format page that provides us a wealth of data. In the center of the format page is the wing form with representation of the nine stations. Below the outer wing stations are diamond symbols that indicate a pylon adapter to carry multiple bombs. Below that is the number of bombs on that station. And then we have the name of the weapon. As you can see, we have two Mark 83s on each outboard wing station and one Mark 84 on both inboard stations. A Mark 84 is boxed and selected on the left inboard station. The selected weapon is also indicated by its legend being boxed at the top of the format page and the ready RDY indication below. Directly below the wing form is status of the master arm switch. In this case, it is set to arm. Press spacebar to continue. Along the left side of the format page at push button 5 is the bombing mode selection. Press this now. You now have the four bomb delivery modes displayed for selection. From top to bottom, auto, flight director or FD mode, CCIP, and manual modes. We'll discuss FD mode in a later lesson. The current mode can be seen listed in the program 1 data block in the bottom center of the format at the top of the left column marked mode. It will default to CCIP at the start of a mission. Go ahead and reselect CCIP by pressing push button 3. Below the mode selections are selections for mechanical fuse or MFUZ and electronic fuse or EFUZ settings. For the bombs we'll drop today, we'll set it as a nose mounted mechanical fuse. Go ahead and press push button 4 to select MFUZ. Now we see the possible mechanical fuse options that include off, no fuse, nose, tail, and NT for nose and tail fuses. Select a nose fuse by pressing push button 4. When you set the M fuse to nose, note the line in the program 1 data for M fuse changed to nose. Press spacebar to continue. Now let's take a look at some of the unique elements of the CCIP bombing HUD. Running from the bottom of the velocity vector is the displayed impact line, or DIL. This is also sometimes referred to as the bomb fall line. Below the velocity vector on the DIL is a horizontal bar with what appears to be upturned wings on the ends. This is the pull-up cue, and this will advise you of potential ground collision. This is not a weapon fragmentation warning. When the velocity vector is below the pull-up cue, the brake X will appear on the HUD. On the right side of the HUD is our selected bombing mode, CCIP. Press the spacebar to unpause. Off your nose at waypoint 1 are three groups of target trucks. Over them is a gate to help mark their location as well as a red smoke marker. You may have noticed a new horizontal bar on the dill up here. This is the reflected release cue. The distance this bar is from the bottom of the dill is proportional to the distance of the CCIP bombing cross is below the HUD field of view. So, as you dive, the cue will drop down the dill until it reaches the bottom and then the bombing cross appears. To get you lined up with the target, fly to place the intersection of the dill and the reflected cue on the point you want to drop your bomb. Try to keep your speed about 500 knots and use smooth control inputs to line up the release. Aim for the group of trucks marked by red smoke. When the CCIP bombing cross appears at the bottom of the dill, and it is over the target, press and hold the weapon release button or press and hold right alt and spacebar. Once the bomb is released, pull up to 30 degrees to keep from impacting the ground. If you miss, Altitude. keep trying. Altitude.
Good hit. Press spacebar when your wings are level, and we'll learn how to create more program settings. If you're not there already, set the left DDI to the bomb's format page. On the page, select the Mark 83 from push button 6. Select the 83B now. This time we're going to release more than one bomb in a pass. In fact, we're going to drop four. On the right side of the bomb's format page is the UFC option on push button 14. Press it now. On the top two option select windows now show QTY and MULT. QTY is short for quantity and MULT is short for multiples. First, press the option select button to the left of quantity. The quantity option select window is now colonized, meaning we can enter data. In this case, we will enter four for the number of bombs we want to drop. After entering four on the UFC keypad, press the enter button on the keypad to save it. When we entered a quantity of greater than one, we now have an INT for interval displayed as an option select window. This will determine the space in feet between the impacts. Select the interval option select button. Let's enter a 500 foot spacing between impacts by entering 500 using the UFC keypad and then pressing the UFC keypad enter button. Press spacebar to continue. The last element we can set is for the multiples. This determines the number of bombs released in each pulse. So, in this case, if we set a multiple of 2 and a quantity of 4 and an interval of 500, two pairs of bombs will be released with 500 feet between the impact of the pairs. Select the multiple option select button. Now enter 2 on the UFC keypad and then press enter on the UFC keypad. Note that on the bombs format page in the data block, we have a quantity of four, a multiple of two, and an interval of 500 feet. This combined with our mode and fuse settings comprise program one for the bomb type. You can create up to five programs for each bomb type and cycle through them using PROG on push button 20. Press spacebar and I will unpause the lesson. Using Mark 83s with a new program we created, circle back around and attack another group of trucks at waypoint 1. As before, try to line up the bombing run using the dill and reflected cue. For best results, you may wish to climb back up to over 10,000 feet before making a bombing run. When you are done practicing CCIP delivery with Mark 83 and Mark 84 bombs, press escape to end the lesson. Alright, I'm not going to do it. Manual bombing mode. Like AG gun and rockets, we can also have a manual mode for the unguided bombs. You can set fixed gun reticle on the HUD to enter mill depression. By using a set mill value with a bomb release dive angle, altitude and airspeed, it can be a handy delivery method in CCIP and auto modes are not available. Manual bombing mode. Like AG gun and rockets, we can also have a manual mode for unguided bombs. We can set a fixed gun reticle on the HUD to an entered mill depression. By using a set mill value with a bomb release dive angle, altitude, and airspeed, it can be a handy delivery method when CCIP and auto modes are not available. First, press the AG master mode button, or 2. Based on what you learned from the CCIP bombing lesson, you can see that you have eight Mark 82 500 pound bombs under the wings. Select 82B from push button 6. This page should look familiar now. Select Mode from push button 5. Select Man on push button 2 to enter manual bombing mode. Next, select push button 4 to set your mechanical fuse. Select Nose Fuse by pressing push button 4. 
We now have program 1 for Mark 82 bombs set up to be in manual mode with a nose fuse setting. On the HUD you will note the fixed aiming pipper and reticle and the manual mode and mill setting on the right side. When in manual mode, your true airspeed is displayed under your calibrated airspeed. Select UFC to display the reticle option on the UFC. Now select the RTCL option select button. As with AG gun and rockets, you can enter a mill value between 0 and 270 to position the aiming reticle and pipper on the HUD. Using what you learned in the CCIP bombing lesson, go ahead and set a release profile with the release quantity of 8 and multiple of 1 and an interval of 100 feet. Set a reticle value of 80 mils. Press spacebar to continue. I have now unpaused the lesson. Ahead of you at waypoint 1 is a line of target trucks. They are marked by a gate and a red smoke marker. For manual bombing to work best, you need to fly a very specific bombing profile. In this case, we have a mill setting of 80, so we want to release our bombs in a 20 degree dive angle at 3,200 feet and at an airspeed of 400 knots. When you are at these parameters and the pipper is over the target, press and hold the weapon release button or the right alt and spacebar keys. Altitude. Altitude. Nice job. You can continue practicing in manual bombing mode or press escape to end the lesson. Nice. Auto bombing mode. Third bombing mode discusses automatic or auto bombing. Select a mode you may be familiar with in A10 sequence CCRP mode. It allows accurate delivery of weapon based on a designated target target point. Uh, this target point can be a waypoint designated on the HUD or set with the mode sensor. Today we look at setting up a target point using the waypoint in the HUD. Uh, then we do a bit of bomb in that location. The big advantage of auto mode is you can do Bomb and level flight, and it's most often used for guided bombs like laser and GPS guided systems. However, you can still use it for unguided bombs. Auto bombing mode. The third bombing mode to discuss is automatic or auto bombing. This is similar to a mode you may be familiar with in the A10C called CCRP mode. It allows accurate delivery of weapons based on designated target point. This target point can be a waypoint, designated on the HUD, or set with another sensor. Today, we'll look at setting up a target point using a waypoint in the HUD, then we will deliver a bomb in that location. The big advantage of auto mode is that you can deliver a bomb in level flight and is most often used for guided bombs like laser and GPS guided systems. However, you can still use it for unguided bombs. First, press the AG master mode button, or 2. Looking at the left DDI, you see we have four Mark 84 2,000 pound bombs under our four wing stations. Select 84 by pressing push button 6. Along the left side of the format page at push button 5 is the bombing mode selection. Press this now. Select auto mode by pressing push button 5. We'll set the fuse now by first pressing M fuse on push button 4. Next, select a nose fuse by pressing push button 4. We will just drop one bomb at a time, so we don't need to fiddle with further bomb program options. 
The first way we'll learn to set a target or TGT point to drop a bomb on is by setting a waypoint to be a target point. On the lower center MPCD, select Waypoint to set this as our navigation steer to source. If you wish, you can press backspace to hide the control stick. Next, press the push button next to the up arrow to select Waypoint 1. We now have Waypoint 1 selected as our navigation point. Press the WPDSG push button to set it as your target. Upon doing so, your waypoint navigation number changed to TGT on the HSI and the diamond is now on the HUD heading tape. The diamond indicates the direction to the target. On the right side of the HUD is also the auto bombing designation with the time to release or REL below it. Below that is range to the target as nautical miles and TGT. In this case, 17 TGT. Running down the HUD is the azimuth steering line, or ASL. This indicates the azimuth you need to fly to reach the target. Along the ASL is the pull-up cue, which appears as a horizontal line with what appears to be upturned wings on the ends. If the velocity vector is below the pull-up cue, you will see the brake X. At the bottom of the HUD is a diamond, and this marks the line of sight to the target. When the target is outside the HUD field of view, it will flash. Additionally, near the top center is your target pointer which points towards the off-HUD target and a numeric above it indicating the degrees off. When you are ready, press spacebar and I will unpause the lesson. We'll now attempt an auto-bombing delivery against the target located at waypoint 1. Fly to place the velocity vector on the ASL and fly level. Keep your speed between 450 and 500 knots. Note the REL time to release and TGT target range decrease as we close the range to the target. Use smooth control inputs to keep the velocity vector over the ASL. Don't ham fist it. At about four miles from the target, a horizontal bar called the release queue appears on the ASL. This drops down the ASL as you close to the target. Hold down the weapon release button or right alt and spacebar key until the release cue passes through the velocity vector. When this happens, the bomb is automatically released. The more accurate you are in keeping the velocity vector over the ASL at time of release will affect bomb accuracy. Try to be wings level and holding a steady airspeed. This will allow the weapon system to calculate an accurate release point a lower altitude can also increase auto bomb accuracy. If your first bomb fails to destroy one of the targets, try again until you do. Good job! Using unguided bombs in auto mode is certainly not the ideal delivery method, but it can be useful at night or bad weather. I'm going to pause the lesson again so we can talk about auto bombing using the HUD to designate a target. First, press the undesignated button, or S, to release waypoint 1 as our TGT location. In order to designate a ground location as the target through the HUD, press forward on the sensor select switch or press right alt and semicolon to set the throttle designator control, control of the HUD. This is indicated by the dot in the center of the velocity vector. When in auto HUD bombing mode, we have a reticle consisting of 12 hash marks. Between this reticle and the velocity vector is a dashed line. 
This line and reticle are referred to as the ball and chain. On the right side of the HUD, we have the auto mode indication. Located at waypoint 2 is a second set of target trucks that will attack. Select the next waypoint on the HSI. Fly to bring waypoint 2 into your HUD field of view and note that the targets are marked with blue smoke. Fly to place the center of the reticle over the center of the target group and press the weapon release button or press enter. Once the location is designated, a dashed diamond marks the location and an ASL appears on the HUD. From here, the bombing delivery is just like we performed using a target waypoint. Fly to place the velocity vector on the ASL and hold down the weapon release button or right alt and spacebar as the weapon release cue passes through the velocity vector. If you wish to refine the location of the diamond, you can slew it using the TDC cursor or the comma, period, backslash, and semicolon keys. Try it out. Remember, to clear a designation, press the undesignated button or press S. Good hits on those targets. When you are ready to exit the lesson, press escape. Hi Dragon Ball Wing. Need to drop bombs at low altitudes. Hi Dragon Bombs like a Mark 82 Snake Eye and Mark 82 Baloo are great tools. Fins of the Snake Eye and the shoot of the Baloo allow the aircraft to drop at very low altitudes but be far away from the blast by the time the bomb impacts. Hi Drag Bomb Delivery. When needing to drop bombs at low altitudes, high drag bombs like the Mark 82 Snake Eye and Mark 82 Baloot are great tools. The fins of the Snake Eye and the shoot of the Balut allow the aircraft to drop at very low altitudes, but be far away from the blast by the time the bomb impacts. These can be delivered from both CCIP and auto modes. In this lesson, I have eight Mark 82 Balut 82YT loaded. Using what you learned in previous lessons, go ahead and set the master mode to AG, select 82YT, set the mode to CCIP, fuse to nose, and UFC options for a quantity of four, a multiple of one, and an interval of 100 feet. This will allow us two bombing passes. When you are done, press spacebar to continue. Let's now configure the bombs to use their high drag balloots. Press the drag at push button 2. We now have options for free fall or FF and retarded or RET. When free fall is selected, the high drag surfaces will not be deployed. When retarded is selected, they will be. Select RET from push button 4. On our program 1 data, we now see RET for the drag option. This is very important for high drag bombs to be dropped accurately. For high drag delivery, a speed of 550 knots and 300 feet is a good profile for accurate delivery and getting in and out of the target area fast. We'll be flying very low, so you may want to set your radar altimeter to 100 feet. If not, I hope you like the whoop whoop sound. Set your HUD to show radar altitude. Set up your navigation for waypoint 1. At waypoint 1 is a group of trucks that are marked with a gate and red smoke. 
can't miss it. We'll hit this target with a level drop at 550 knots at 300 feet above the ground. I have a second target group at waypoint 2 to also practice on. This is also marked by a gate, but is marked with blue smoke. When ready, press spacebar and I'll unpause the lesson. Line up your velocity vector above the target while in level flight. When the CCIP cross is over the target, press and hold the weapon release button or right alt and spacebar key. Good hits on those dastardly trucks. Come to a heading of about 72 degrees to hit the second target group at waypoint 2. When you are done, press escape to end the lesson. Alright, quit. Kind of stimulation bombing, last one. In addition to the high explosive general purpose bombs like Mark 2, A3, and A4, you also have kind of images at your disposal. Also, to the term cluster bombs, the F-18C can carry their Mark 20 Rock Raid 2, CBU-99 and CBU-100, or three munitions carrying two and 47 Mark 118 Mod 1 bomblets. The Mark 118 bomblet contains a shaped, charged warhead designed for anti-armor use. As such, these bomblets are good at defeating armor but have very little proximity damage effect. The effect of the bomblet is directly attacked by three versions in addition only different canister fuses. Canister munitions. In addition to high explosive general purpose bombs like the Mark 82, 83, and 84, you also have canister munitions at your disposal. Also termed cluster bombs, the FA-18C can carry the Mark 20 Rock I-2 and CBU-99 and 100. All three munitions carry 247 Mark 118 Mod 1 bomblets. The Mark 118 bomblet contains a shaped charge warhead designed for anti-armor use. As such, these bomblets are good at defeating armor, but have very little proximity damage effect. To be effective, the bomblet must directly hit the target. The three versions of the munition only differ in their canister and fuses. Today, we have eight Mark 20s loaded and two groups of various armored vehicles to devastate. As should be routine now, set master mode to AG. Select Mark 20s by pressing push button six. We'll keep the UFC option as is. A big difference when setting up a canister munition profile is the fuse setting. Rather than an impact fuse, we'll need to initiate the fuse when the munition is over the target area so the bomblets can disperse over the desired weapon effect area. We'll do this with the mechanical fuse or M fuse. Press push button 4 to select M fuse. From the M fuse selections, select Variable Timed or VT on push button 3. When we selected VT as the fuse type, we now have an HT, Height, option on push button 1. This will set the weapon computer to provide weapon release cues based on what height the fuse is set to physically open on the canister. The physical fuse and the fuse setting in the program must match. By default, the physical fuse is set to 1500 feet. Continually press push button 1 until 1500 is displayed in the HT field for program in the data block. Press spacebar once the HT value is set to 1500. Once that is done, set your HUD to show radar altitude. While canister munitions can be delivered in auto mode, CCIP is recommended for better accuracy. As reviewed in the CCIP bombing lesson, we have a dill, pull-up cue, and reflected cue on the HUD. As with CCIP general purpose bombs, we will fly to place the CCIP bombing cross over the target and then hold down the weapon release button, or right alt and spacebar key, to release the munition. Before we try this though, set your radar altimeter to 1500 feet 
to alert us if we are below the fuse height. In addition to the altitude warning, you would also see a dud cue on the HUD. Press spacebar to unpause the mission. For best accuracy, a specific attack profile is recommended. Perform a diving attack on the target with the velocity vector between negative 25 and negative 30 degrees on the HUD pitch ladder. Maintain an airspeed of 500 knots and release the weapon at 2,500 feet radar altitude. Give it a try against the target group at waypoint one. It's marked by a gate and red smoke. Line up your velocity vector over the target, but at level flight. <coughs> if the CIP cross is over the target, press and hold the weapon release button, or right alt and spacebar key when at 2,500 feet, 500 knots, and a dive angle between 25 and 30 degrees. Altitude. Altitude. Good hits on those BTRs. At waypoint two is a second set of armored targets to practice on. When you are done, press escape to end the lesson. All right, we did it. All right, guys, that's all for this part. If you liked it, smash like the button, make a banner, leave a comment. I'll see you guys next time. Farewell.